So today we're going to talk about robots. Humanoid robots in particular. So these humanoid robots, these are robots in the human form. Two legs, two arms, torso, and head. Often in Hollywood movies, robots are depicted in the human form. Like such as uh, these kind of movies, including the scary Terminator. But do we really need robots in this shape and form as a human? Now, uh, the architect Louis Sullivan once said, form follows function. So in robotics, this means that the shape of the robot is really dictated by the task it needs to accomplish. So some good example is these robots. So this robot is uh, uh, you know, very often used in hospitals for delivering medication to the patient. But does this robot look like a nurse? It does not. Or the very uh, you know, popular, these uh, uh, vacuum cleaning robots, you probably have one at home. Do these look like a janitor? It does not. So its task is to vacuum the floor, so it looks like a low-profile hockey puck, so it can go under the desk and do its job. So if that's the case, then why and when would we need humanoid robots? Well, I can think of many, many reasons, but one of probably the most important reasons, well, this is my personal vision, is I would like to have humanoid robots living in my home, you know, helping with the chores, tasks like washing the dishes, doing the laundry, taking out the trash. And for these robots to live in our home in an environment designed by humans for humans, I say that we need robots in the form and size of a humanoid. The reason being is there's a reason why your door handle is this high. There's a reason why your step size is this high. Because uh, for, so the robots, if they want to go around in a home, it needs to be the human size to go around. Also, we want these robots to use the same tools to evolve for humans. You don't want to have a special scissors, for example, designed for a human. But probably more equally or probably more important than this is the reason why we're doing research on humanoid robots is because we want to understand us humans better. Now, a good example is uh, in the process of trying to make these bipedal humanoids walk, we get a better insight of how we humans walk with two legs. And this knowledge can be used for developing better prosthetic legs, for example. All right, so let's take a look at some of the humanoid robots that we developed in our lab at Virginia Tech. So this robot is called Darwin. It stands for Dynamic Anthropomorphic Robot Intelligence. And this is our first attempt to develop a humanoid robot. This is in 2004. So at this time, this was very revolutionary. Uh, can you go one slide to the back? Okay, can you have audio for the video as well? Thank you. So this was a feasibility study. What kind of motors can you use? What kind of control should you use? Is it even possible? So this particular robot does not have any sensors, no feedback control. And as you probably know, if you don't have any feedback and there's external disturbances, then things happen like this. <laughs> so with this limited success in the following year in 2005, we started to design the next generation of Darwin robots. Starting from the kinematics, we did proper mechanical design, kinematical spherical joint. And in 2005, Darwin 1 was born. Now Darwin 1 now can stand up on its own and it can walk. Again, at the time, this was very revolutionary. However, still notice that we have an umbilical cord. We have a cord that goes to the outside. So we're still using external power and external computation. But based on the success in the following year in 2006, now it's time to have fun. We wanted to give it intelligence. So we gave it all the sensor it needs, all the computation power it needs, 1.5 gigahertz Pentium M chip, firewire cameras, four-stroke sensors, lithium powder batteries, all the sensors need, and now Darwin is intelligent. So in this video, you can see uh, Darwin tracking an object. So if you move an object in front of its head, with its head, it can track the object. Or here you can see the view from the robot Darwin. Now the reason why it's shaking is because Darwin walks like a Frankenstein. And it tries to see this orange ball and put a, put a blue dot on it. Now why a ball? Because we want to make this robot play a game of soccer. So now this video shows a fully autonomous operation. Nobody is remote controlling it. There's no tethers. With its onboard camera using artificial intelligence, it searches for the ball, searches for the ball, and it tries to kick the ball into the goal and play a game of soccer. By the way, this is 3 a.m. in our lab. And this was our first successful goal. Goal! You can hear the excitement from our students. So with this, with this video, we're the first team from the United States to qualify in a competition called RoboCup. Now, RoboCup is an international autonomous, soccer co ro autonomous robot soccer competition with an official goal of by the year 2050, we want to have these full-size humanoid robots play soccer against the human World Cup champions and win. It's an official goal. Well, it's a very challenging goal, but we believe that we can do it, so we're pushing the uh, technical, uh, technical uh, 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 technology. 
So we start participating in 2007. I think this is three years ago in China. That's the Darwin 3 robot. Just to give an idea of the pace of the, uh, the competition. So this is all fully autonomous. Nobody's controlling anything. <laughs> That's the goalkeeper. I mean, if you look very closely, these robots have personality. You can look at these, you know, robot. Look at his head. It's tracking the ball. This is very, very difficult thing to achieve. It's pretty remarkable what you can do with these robots. Uh, so in 2007, the first time you entered Robocop was in 2007. It was in the United States and Atlanta, Georgia. And this is the first time I've seen this beautiful trophy. It's called the Louis Vuitton Cup Best Humanoid Award. It's a Baccarat Crystal Globe. And I thought this was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life, except for my wife. So at the point, I promised my students, we are going to bring this trophy to the United States. And I gave a promise to our students. Now, I'm going to get back to RoboCup, but let's move on. So we use this Darwin robot for many, many different research tasks and things, but we also have a lot of fun. So this is a couple of years ago when the Roanoke Symphony Orchestra came to our campus. Guess who was the uh, guest conductor? It was Darwin conducting the orchestra. So we do a lot of fun things like this too. So Darwin's been evolving. So this is Darwin 4 in 2009. Darwin is now much smarter, stronger, faster. And this video is trying to show off, I'm macho, I'm dynamic. I can do like martial art movements like Jackie Chan. It's pretty incredible. <laughs> and it walks away. So. We had so much success with this miniature robot Darwin. So we've been getting so many emails, phone calls, and letters from researchers and research labs from all around the world that they want to purchase this robot to use for education and research. The problem is it's, we didn't have a good mechanism to sell these robots because we are in a university institution. So we wrote a research proposal to the National Science Foundation, and we proposed to develop an open source version of Darwin called Darwin OP. OP stands for Open Platform. This is a project with Purdue University, University of Pennsylvania, and a company called Robotis. Now, the cool thing about this project is this project is a fully open source software and open source hardware, meaning all the software we develop is online for free. You can download it, use it as is. We want you to hack it, modify it, and upload your code. We want to build a user community to really you know, foster the development of human robots. The hardware is also, also open source. How to make it, fabrication manual, assembly manual, all the blueprints are online for free. You can download it and build your own. We also, the company is also selling it too if you want to buy it too. So we had a lot of success with the Darwin robot. So in the development process, the first uh, beta tester was a cute little boy called Ethan, uh, two years old, and he's actually my son. Let's take a quick video, look at a quick video of my first beta tester of Darwin OP. Oops. Oops. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so now it's in autonomous mode, so it's okay. artificial intelligence. It's trying to play a game of soccer. <laughs> now, Ethan Ball. thinks uh, Darwin OP is alive. <laughs> and suddenly it disappears. And then what he does is he brings his favorite uh, <laughs> toy. No, no, it needs the orange ball. Small ball, orange ball. No, small, no, no, no. Orange ball, orange ball. No. So still, robots, no. artificial intelligence, we got a long way to go. Bring back, bring back orange ball. Yes, thank you. Give it to robot. Hi, robot. So still we have a lot of bugs in our robot. And then... <laughs> so by the way, we fixed that problem now. So now hundreds of units are being used worldwide. Thank you. So hundreds of units are being used worldwide. So a lot of different researchers are using Darwin OP for different type of research projects. This is a group that designed a new type of robotic gripper. Now the cool thing is, 
It's not using additional motors or actuators, it's using existing motors and some clever mechanical design using springs and cams and accomplish these kind of things. This is another group. This is from University of Pennsylvania. This is something remarkable. They're doing, using uh, uh, machine learning technology to actually teach a robot how to withstand external disturbance, how to reject these kind of things. So push it, it uses its hip to balance, just like a human. Even once walking with poke it, it can balance. So people are using these robots for high-end uh, research tasks as well. Uh, this is also from the same group. Now, we humans take it for granted working together, but trying to use robots to work together, you know, transferring a single object is a very, very challenging task. In this case, two darn OPs are trying to move a stretcher together. Again, as I mentioned, it's a very, very difficult thing to implement, thus. Now here you can actually peek inside in the brain of Darwin. So this is artificial intelligence. So you can see how Darwin sees the world, how it interprets what it means. We call it the word model and what, it's, what kind of decisions it's making. The state machine, you can see, get a, get a peek inside the artificial intelligence of the robot. We also have a nice simulation software package. Uh, this is called WeBots and the actual model, Darwin OP model is free. You can download it. And before you, can, before you actually implement these new algorithms, the hardware, you can test it in software. So it's a very, very useful tool. All right, so I told you about the goal of RoboCup is full-size human robots. So we actually started to do work on that right now. So this is called Charlie L. Charlie stands for Cognitive Humanoid Autonomous Robot Learning Intelligence. L stands for Lightweight. So you can, this is a real picture. So you saw that soccer ball. That's in a real soccer field, so you can see the size of this. So early last year, we uh, unveiled Charlie to the general public for the very first time. So he's greeting people, saying hi. Now, at this time, it was not autonomous. So one of my students actually remote controlling it behind the wall, almost like Wizard of Oz. So that's Charlie the very first time. Now, again, this is the first time we made it walk. If you look at it, it's actually not that impressive. Very small steps. It walks almost like an old man. But again, we take it for granted, but there's only a handful of groups in the entire world who can develop a, can implement a full-size human wall, wall, a robot walking like this. But with this success, Charlie's been the superstar. He's been on TV covers and magazines, and it's been recognized as the United States' very first full-size autonomous walking human robot. So based on that, we, this year we unveil, unveiled the next generation, Charlie 2, much smarter, sleeker looking, uh, faster, more stable. Even the design is beautiful, the beautiful mechanical design of the hip and the ankle. One of my students, JK, designed the mechanical design of Charlie. So this is the first time it started walking early this year. Its walking speed is about 0.4 meters per second, but this is not its full speed. We believe we can go, make it go faster, 20% faster with optimization. Fully uh, omnidirectional sidestep can turn everything like this. As I mentioned, Charlie is very, very lightweight, and we did that on purpose for safety reasons as well. Because whenever you do these kind of experiments in the lab, always things happen, as you can see. So when you have trouble with robots, because it's lightweight, you can do this. You start to see this uh, common theme with our robot experiments here. So uh, this movie clip shows open loop walking. So it's not using any sensors. So if there's any disturbances, it falls down. So to do that, we use these sensors called IMU, Initial Measurement Unit Sensors. It's like a balance sensor in your ear. So it measures the acceleration of the XYZ, angular acceleration of the XYZ. And based on that information, it tries to balance itself. So even though you push it, it's very stable. You never see people do something like this on other full-size human robots. Charlie is very, very stable in that sense. Yeah. Pretty cool. <coughs> All right, back to RoboCup. So this is a picture that really depicts, represents the excitement of this game. So this year, uh, RoboCup was in Istanbul, Turkey. We had two teams, one in the adult size league with the Charlie 2 robot and the kid size league with the Darren OP robot. Let me show you a quick video of the adult size. So this is Charlie playing soccer fully autonomously. Nobody's controlling anything. Look at his head. He's looking around, not only searching for the ball, but he's trying to figure out where he is in the environment. So the rule is just one against one, a goalie and a, a striker, he needs to first find the ball and tap it to the other half of the, uh, the uh, uh, field Come on, first. Come Charlie, you can do it! So he, once he does that, he walks to the other side and goes to the ball. Okay, now he's on the other side, now he needs to kick the ball into the goal. Yeah, come on Charlie, you got this! Let's go, Hokies! Yeah! <laughs> yeah! 
Now, the funniest thing is, if you look at it, all of us are really, really excited. But, you know, if you look at it, it's really small. Again, it walks, it taps the ball. It's not too impressive. But we know how difficult it is. This is the booby clip for the kid size of it. It's much more active. So, uh, <laughs> So it's three against three. They do team playing. Let me show you another movie clip. This is the final match against a team from Japan. You can appreciate the dynamic environment. Again, using artificial intelligence, nobody's controlling anything. We have a lot of fans for our team, Darwin. So how do you do this here? So you remember that photo I showed at the beginning in 2007, I saw this beautiful Louis Vuitton Cup trophy, and I promised everybody that we will bring this to the United States. This year, we made it happen. We won RoboCup this year in the adult size and the kid size, and we brought the Louis Vuitton Cup trophy for the United States for the very first time. Thank you. So personally, I would like to believe this actually has a significant symbolic meaning. So this is a trophy when you win it as a champion. You only keep it for one year, and the next year you need to return it to the Robocop Federation, and the next year winning team takes it. Japan had this trophy for six years straight, and then Germany won the competition, and they took it for two years. And this is the very first time that we're bringing it to the United States. I would like to believe this shows the, the shift in the human robot uh, you know, superpowers from Japan to Germany to the United States. Well, we'll see. All right, so we want first place and second place. Oh, I will also let you know that RoboCup next year, 2012, do you know where it's going to be held? It's going to be in Mexico, so Mexico City, in June next year. So we're very excited, are we pumped? So hopefully you'll be able to come in RoboCup and see some of our new cutting-edge technology that we're bringing up in our lab. So we already st started testing our robots in the real soccer field. So this is a very difficult task. I mean, 2050, humans against robots, we don't have a lot of time to so start doing these uh, tests. So we get a lot of questions from people. I mean, this is RoboCup, exciting, it's fun, but why are you really spending so much money, time, and effort on building soccer playing robots, right? But if you think about it, to build a robot that can play autonomous soccer, there's a lot of challenging robotics problems that you need to solve. Artificial intelligence, vision, autonomous behavior, design and control, mechanics, power sources. You need to solve all these problems to develop such a robot. If you think about it, if a robot can't even play a game of soccer, how will we use these robots for real life applications, right? So all the technology we developed by developing a human robot, now we're using these technologies to truly save people's lives. This is our latest project called Sapphire. It stands for Shipboard Autonomous Firefighting Robot. This is a project uh, funded by the US Navy. And we are now developing humanoid robots that fight fire on the Navy ships. Now, interestingly, the original research proposal was a firefighting hose itself is a robot, like a snake robot. So it slithers to the fire, props us like a cobra and fight fires. But we later decided to change it to a human robot. Again, the reason is this. If you look at it, if you've been on a Navy ship, we have really narrow corridors, you know, steps, and even the doors, if you open this hatch, it has a very, very high door seal. So unless you have a bipedal robot, you won't be able to go around and navigate the, uh, the Navy ship. Also, this is a firefighting robot, so you need to shield it against temperature and fire. If you have wheels or treads, you cannot enclose them because they need to be exposed and continuous rotating. But if you have a humanoid robot, I mean, a human can put a firefighting suit and withstand the heat. Same thing if you have a humanoid robot, put it in a firefighter suit, and that's how we do it. The ship also is a sea state, state and moves up and down. Wheels cannot balance, but if you have a humanoid robot, it can balance itself. So that's why we're using humanoid robots. So we have scenarios of try to use these humanoid robots cooperative with human fire, uh, firefighting robots to fight fires. So I think this is the very first time we're unveiling to the general public. This is our first prototype of Sapphire. Uh, we're doing some, something very novel. Instead of these rotational joints, we use these linear actuators like a human muscle that can expand and contract. We also put titanium strings to put compliance. And we're just doing some really neat stuff. Now, I really, really want to bring our robots here for a live demonstration, but I couldn't. So instead, I brought a quick uh, movie clip. So let's take a look at that. When I was seven years old, I watched the movie Star Wars for the very first time. And on my way back home in the car, I decided to become a robot scientist, and it never changed my mind, and I'm here today. My name is Dennis Hong. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering at Virginia Tech and the founding director of Romella.
Robotics is really a really wide field from one end of the spectrum, from more the mechanical sciences, mechanical engineering, kinematics design, to the other end of the spectrum, more the computer science side of artificial intelligence and anything in between. You really need to know everything to develop a full system. We first try to generate walking motion just by you know, almost like a stop motion animation, just creating the motion of legs and hopefully it's gonna walk. And it turns out that that's not the case. Both Charlie and Darwin use a method called ZMP, Zero Moment Point Control Method. ZMP walking is more like a robot walking, trying to keep my ZMP right under my foot. So as long as you can create a motion that the ZMP is under your foot or the foot support polygon, then theoretically you're gonna be stable. Humans walk in a very different way. First of all, when you walk, you swing your leg. You swing your leg, catch the fall, stand up again, and then you fall forward, and you swing your leg, and your body also swings forward. Now, ZMP is probably the most stable way to implement bipedal walking. The problem is, inherently, ZMP method can only work on smooth, hard, uh, flat terrain. So the next uh, step in bipedal walking is a good example is our new robot called Sapphire. You probably know the big dog from Boston Dynamics, the very impressive four-leg robot. Think of uh, Sapphire as a two-leg version of the big dog. People, when they see our robots because they watch sci-fi movies like the iRobot and they say, wow, this robot Charlie walking, this is really neat and cool. But why can't, why doesn't it jump? Why doesn't it run? Power source is a big problem. The batteries that we use, lithium polymer batteries, can, uh, uh, for example, power up Charlie for only about 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, better actuators that mimic uh, biological muscles better. We need more compliance and different way of doing force control. So all of these uh, component technologies need to catch up, to be catched up to develop the next generation robotics. In about 10 years, uh, hopefully we'll start to see a more domestic robots that can actually help people uh, in the home. We want these robots to use tools developed for humans. You ask the robot, hey, fetch me a beer from the fridge. You do not want to have a special refrigerator just for the robot. You want the robot to open up the door of the fridge or pick up the phone, use the scissors, all the tools designed for humans. Thus, I believe uh, developing humanoid robots is very important. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Thank you. So, what do you think? Do you think we'll be able to reach the goal of by year 2050 have humans against the humanoid robots and play a game of soccer? Do you believe that we'll have humanoid robots truly saving people's lives? Do you think humanoid robots can be our friends, our companions, and workers in our home? Well, we're working very hard to make that happen. Thank you very much. Thank you.